Hey everybody, it's the Waiting for Next Year.com podcast. Before we record the three sports podcasts, I got Ben Axelrod here, and we're going to talk about some different sports topics and media topics. But first, your book. Yes. You've got an Ohio State book. I do have an Ohio State book. It's called Urban Meyer vs. College Football, The Case for College Football's Greatest Coach. Uh, it officially went on sale last week, but um, or it, it officially hit shelves last week, but it had been in the Columbus area before that and, and available. On, it's been a, available on Amazon for um, about a month now, or, or at least it's been shipping from Amazon. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, a quote-unquote published author, and, and it's weird to say that because it, it's when, when I think of like a published author, I think of uh, not me, and, and I think of somebody who's published something uh, very significant, but um, it, it was a fun process. It, it was a fun project, and, and really, I mean, I got contacted by Triumph Books. To, they were looking for somebody to write the book. It's kind of a, a part of a series where there's a LeBron James versus the NBA. There's a Nick Saban versus college football. There's a, a Tom Brady versus the NFL. And they were looking for somebody to, to write the Urban Meyer version. And, and I kind of took it on just saying, okay, I, I can say now that I've written a book. And uh, But it was really a, a fun process, and I'm glad that I did it. Did they give you the outline? No, that that was the one cool thing was they pretty much gave me the title and and they didn't they they sent me a copy of of the Nick Saban book and the the Tom Brady book so I I kind of got grabbed some ideas from from those but really I kind of formatted it how I wanted to format it and That's great. Yeah, that that was a fun part of it was it's it's split into different sections like most books are but uh there there's a whole section the the whole first section is pretty much a biography on Urban Meyer and uh kind of rehashing, you know, his rise from from really his youth to where he is now at Ohio State. Um, and then the second section is Urban Meyer versus Peers, where it's a look at him versus some of his contemporaries in, in college football, uh, or, or him versus rivals, and, and that's a look at him versus yeah. contemporaries. And um, then the third section is Urban Meyer versus Idols, and that's a, a comparing his resume to some of the legends. And then at the end, I just kind of do some fun stuff where I do an all Urban Meyer team and I, I take a look at his coaching tree. So I kind of formula, formulated it however I wanted to, and, and it was kind of just one big 60,000 word column. But um, I'm, I'm really proud of it and, and really happy with how it turned out. So it's also turned you into a hustler. <laughs> you're like, you're out there doing book signings. What's that been like? Um, the book signings have been interesting. I, I did one at Ohio State that quite frankly, didn't go that well. Because I've, I've been to a couple of book signings, and they're, they can be kind of weird. Right. Well, it's, I mean, like if Hillary Hillary Clinton's out on tour, like, yeah, yeah. people are going to wrap around the, the building for Hillary Clinton. Like, I'm not a celebrity. Right. Like, John I'm, Grisham does a book signing. Right. Yeah. I okay. mean, that's a, a lot of celebrities or, or a lot of well-established authors. I'm, I'm just a guy on Twitter, pretty much. And Yeah. Your, your topic is selling the book. Right. You know, maybe someday Ben Axelrod, the author, will sell a book. Yeah. But right now it's the topic. It is. And, and so they set up these book signings. And uh, I did one on Ohio State's campus that it was the day of the Oklahoma game. Uh-huh. And so it was like, all right, we're just going to sit you here in front of the store. And, and me, it's it's Ohio State's bookstore. It's the Big Barnes & Noble there on High Street. And, and everybody's just shopping for the game because it's a big team store. It, it's a big, it's the official Ohio State bookstore. So I sold like four books there. Like, and that two were out of pity, I think. But <laughs> uh, the, the Cleveland one was cool. I did one at Crocker Park last week. And um, there, there were some people who stopped by and, and who came there, I, I think, to see me. But some just passing by. I took interest in the book, and, and I had a lot of family and friends come to that one too. So that, people, that, people who have enough money to buy books, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah, the hard copy of the book. I, I don't because if you're in front of a bunch of students and they're making hard choices between you know the, uh, a nice meal, oh yeah, at a bar and your book, well, sorry. Yeah, well, especially to to be at Crocker Park on a Saturday afternoon yeah. is much different to be on the Ohio State campus the, sure. the Saturday afternoon of a game day. I, I had a lot of people uh, walk by and say, you know, I'd buy it, but I don't want to carry it around the rest of the day, which I think they were just being nice, but but I appreciate it. But that makes it. a lot of sense, even if they were, you know, if right. they are telling the truth. Yeah, so... so. Um, all right, so we've we've talked a bunch about uh, a lot of different things, and of course, later on on the three sports pod, we're going to do the the preview of the Browns versus the Colts. Um, but before we went live, we were talking a lot about sports media, and this is mm-hmm. something you think about all the time. Yeah. You've been at different stops along the way. You're at Land of Ten, now you're at WKYC, and we're all playing in all these different worlds. Waiting for next year is putting stuff on YouTube now, and 
it's just a weird time. I mean, and maybe it'll always be a weird time, but I feel like we're beholden to Facebook. We're beholden to Google who owns YouTube. Yeah. We're beholden to Google who owns Google, you yeah. know, for our web traffic. And then I'm not even sure what our web traffic is worth anymore. Yeah. Because ad rates are f f falling through the bottom on, uh, on, on, you know, websites in terms of written content. It's, do, do you think much about this kind of stuff, or are you, are you, is your head down just like creating content and creating podcasts and, you know? Oh, I, I think about it all the time, and, and that's, I mean, even when I was just in, in, in college and, and a journalism student, like, I just, I was so fascinated by the industry, and this is 2010, 2011, when, when Twitter's starting to, to take off and uh, change everything. I Right now, I guess what I'm, I'm wrestling with and, and what I find interesting is... Um, like we talked about the aggregation and I think about like, like what do you like to consume? And, and for me, it's, I like to consume like big meaty uh, profile pieces like, like Lee Jenkins and Wright Thompson are, are my two favorite writers. And like Lee Jenkins came out with this profile of Dwight Howard this week that, that I can't wait to read. Like I've just been, I, I need like an hour at home alone just to like digest this big Wright Tom or uh, uh, Lee Jenkins, uh, uh, Dwight Howard piece and the bits and pieces of it get aggregated everywhere to the point where I've already heard it discussed ad nauseum on, on the yep. radio. And it's to, like, that's the obviously Lee Jenkins is like the top of the top when it comes to sports writers. And now all these other sites, including if, if he had written about a Cavs player, I, I would have been doing the same thing, uh, sure. aggregating it, have, have been siphoning off, you know, bits and pieces of it. Um, and it just makes you wonder, like, like I think about the athletic too, because I think what they're doing is, is very interesting. They're trying to do something different, but if Jason Lloyd has a nugget in his article, it's going to wind up on pro basketball talk. It's going to wind up, uh, potentially on WKYC. I mean, it, it, it could wind up any number of places. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think, I, I think, you know, what I give the athletic a lot of credit for is they're trying something different because nobody knows where anything's heading. And, and at the very least, they're, they're trying a different model. But yeah, I mean, I, I think about this stuff all the time, both as somebody who produces content and, and who consumes it. And so how do you, when you, because so at Waiting for Next Year, we've pretty much skewed away from the pure aggregation just because we can't win that battle. Right. Um, and so now it's more about if you can add an opinion or a tone of voice or you have a take, not, not a hot take, but right. you need a point of view. A perspective. A perspective in order for us to write about it. And that way we're not on a time crunch either because we can talk about Miles Garrett's ankle and the impact a day after if, you, if we've thought about it and we have something interesting to say. Right. Um, so how do you balance that line between, all right, I got to get this out, I got to get this out now, versus, hey, I'm building this Ben Axelrod voice, and I don't mean to put you in the third right. person, but out there in whatever land, you want people to get to know you and your voice. Yeah, no, it, it's been different um, since coming to WKYC because we are kind of strictly a, a news site. I mean, I have the, the freedom if I want to write an editorial um, or do a podcast like we do with the three sports podcast, I can do that. Or, or I can do it in a video, but you know, if, if something happens with LeBron James in, from a news story, and and everybody's talking about it, we need it on our site. Like we just need it. We need it for the news aspect. We need it as a, a potential story on on Donovan Live. Like we just need it. So because um, it, it might hit the TV, right? And yeah, it's much easier for it to hit it to hit the TV if it's hit your website first. Yeah, and, and it probably will hit the TV if, if if it's about LeBron James nowadays. But um, yeah, I mean, when I was at Land of Ten. Uh, my last gig covering Ohio State, we actually, I thought, had a good setup there where we had a staff specifically dedicated to aggregating, whereas the the kind of, I was a senior writer, I think, or, or feature writer. My job was then to to find that perspective and find the take and find the, the column or, or the, the long form feature that can be done off of that. Um, and when I was at Bleacher Report, it was kind of the same thing. You know, that was, when I went to Bleacher Report, I remember my very first week, Braxton Miller threw out his shoulder and, and I was sitting on pins and needles waiting to write something and my editors were like, no, we, we've got the news story covered. You need to come up with the who is JT Barrett story for, for tomorrow. So, um, you know, I, I think that's the thing though is, is you know, like Cleveland.com because I have a lot of friends who write there and have written there, their beat writers are kind of tasked with doing both where they need to grab, yeah. you know, the, the Miles Garrett is, is out of his walking boot story. And they also need to grab the, well, what does this mean moving forward? So um, it, it, I think it's just a complicated time for everybody. And, and we were kind of talking off air, like 
a lot of this, like you said, is is you're leaving it in Google's hands. You're leaving it in Facebook hands. We we don't know. And, and then I think the the elephant in the room is you know Twitter is is also just. Twitter's out there, and, and Twitter has kind of become everybody's uh, news source. So I don't know, but it's definitely something I'm always thinking about. The one thing that I always keep in mind about Twitter is just how many people are not on Twitter. Yeah. And so sometimes in the back channels at Waiting for Next Year, we're like, oh, well, that's old news. We talked about that on Twitter like four hours ago. Yeah. But there are so many people who read our website and read WKYC who are not on Twitter and will never be on Twitter and only know of Twitter when it's pasted into a web page. Yeah, I mean, there, there are still some people who just listen to sports talk radio for their sports news. Or, um, you know, I, I think like the Bleach Report app, the, the Team Stream app that gives you just like updates on everything. I, I think that's a big thing because a lot of people are just getting their news that way. So. And I think it's more than we, we're willing to admit sometimes. Right, yeah. It's, that's the, the other thing is like Twitter, I, I think like, you know, like not to get political, but like I think as the election showed, like Twitter is clearly a bubble where, or, or at least you can turn it into a bubble where you're choosing literally who you're following and you're, you're maybe not getting the, the whole story or, or maybe not getting both sides of the story or, or anything. So yeah, that's, I mean, Twitter... Twitter's really interesting to me because I always kind of thought Twitter would at some point be a fad and, and go away, and we're going on more than 10 years now, so clearly it yeah. has staying power. So. I didn't think... Th- I, I I thought that communication style would exist forever. I figured somebody would supplant Twitter as, like, the platform. Right, I'm yeah. There are, it would evolve into something else, but, I mean, you know, they're, they're, you can do GIFs now and stuff, but really it's... And Facebook is clearly never going to be Twitter. Right, no, It's oh, like no. a totally different ecosystem. Yeah, fa- I, well, especially with the Facebook Lives and everything. I mean, I actually think they've yeah. done a good job keeping up, obviously, with, with what they want to be, but... Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, it, it's, you, you go on Facebook and, and you'll see, you know, I see my dad discussing something about sports that uh, is either old or, or I, I didn't see on Twitter or, or whatever. It's just, it, it's a crazy time. Yeah. Um, how temporary does the aggregation part of our jobs feel? Like, I, I just kind of figure t- t- even 10 years from now that, that we'll look back on this and go, Man, that was a lot of wasted effort. Like, why do we go to all that trouble? Because like the the content will like live in the place where it lives, and there's no need to take it out of the podcast and bring it over here. But right now, you have to aggregate Brian Winhurst's NBA podcast right. because it's on. It's not searchable as it is now. So when you hear that nugget, you pull it out, you put it in written form, and then everybody can see it on Google. Yeah, I um, I've, I've thought about this too because I read this piece that Clay Travis wrote in July where yeah. Um, he was one. It was like the real Clay Travis. It wasn't the character that, that he's turned into in the last two months. But he's a WWE wrestler. He now. is a WWE. I mean, he he very clearly is, and all the more power to him. But but I think it's a shame because he's obviously a very bright guy, and, and I think he's dumbing himself down. But that's. Hey, I feel like the same thing for Whitlock. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people like that. I used to. We, I was not to get off track, but I was talking on on Twitter with somebody. I was a huge Jason Whitlock fan. So like, was I. Five years ago, like when he was at Fox Sports the first time around before he, he went back to ESPN, like I loved his columns. I, I loved his perspective. I loved his podcasts. I remember yeah. he did a podcast with Dan Lebitard that, that is what really sold me on Dan Lebitard. But he's become a parody of himself. He really ha- I mean, that's that's kind of been FS1's kind of, of gimmick to, to go with a wrestling term. But um, so Clay Travis, Clay Tra- he, he wrote a post about fixing sports media. And um, because it was it was around the time where everybody was getting laid off, I think Fox Sports had just done their big layoffs with with pivoting the video or whatever. And yeah. obviously there were the ESPN layoffs. I actually I mean, Bleacher Report, it, they weren't layoffs, but they didn't renew a bunch of contracts back in January, which had I stayed at Bleacher Report, like would have been my contract, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, I mean, that kind of hit home. And then I had friends at ESPN who got laid off. But And we all knew people at Fox Sports. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, especially in Twitter. I mean, even if you don't know them personally, right. we're all kind of connected in this, this weird way. But um, he said he thought aggregation was temporary, which on the one hand I could see... But it also, the way it's trending right now, it's almost going the other way, where, where it's more aggregation and more and more aggregation. And, you know, you could cover the Browns right now from your couch. Now, yes. the flip side to that is you need Mary Kay Cabot out there. You need Tony Grossi out there. You, you yes. need Dan Lobby and, and you need Zach Jackson and, and Tom Reed and, and all the people out there who are actually asking the questions. And that's Although the teams are trying to replace them, too. When, well, they, when they tweet and they say, we've traded so-and-so or... You know, they, they're almost being their own beat reporters in-house, which, 
you know, is kind of a scary proposition too. Thank goodness it's just sports, but it's. I mean, it, they, well, certain if they could, they would rather the news come straight out of their people than filtered through Mary Kay, Tom Reed, Zach well, Jackson, or anybody else. No, I, I think that's actually interesting. And in, in you, you look at the Players' Tribune and, and mm-hmm. what that's provided for athletes. Richard Jefferson was talking about this on on a podcast. The one uh, with Bill Simmons. He, on that one and with Dave McMenamin okay. when, when they had Dave on as a guest um, and how that has, has given athletes a different voice. I th- when I heard about the Players' Tribune, like I thought it was a joke at first. Like I was yeah. like, this is never going to last. And now you see the, the staying power that it has and, and why it has that staying power. Um, I... Yeah, I mean, Darren Rovell, I think, had a tweet like a month ago where he said, uh, I think they actually referenced this in the podcast, where he said, you know, the the most likely landing spot for young journalism students right now are, are the, the best jobs are with teams, with athletes, um, and maybe with brands or something. But, I mean, that's like, I mean, I know Michigan football, they have a beat writer employed by, by Michigan who, who covers the team and sits in press conferences. And, and I think that's, you know, I, I, the Browns do that. They have staff writers. Sure. Um, a lot of teams are doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that I always joked about that when we were at, uh, when I was covering Ohio State, is Urban last year especially got, was, was notorious for sidestepping questions. And, and he would say, on to Rutgers or on to Maryland, or, or I'm just thinking about Rutgers or I'm just thinking about Maryland. And uh, uh, Ari Wasserman, my, my buddy who's, who's with The Athletic now, he would always get so frustrated. And, and we would talk afterwards or, or talk before, and he would say, well, why are we even here then? If, if that's all he's going to say, when we're, why are we even here? I go, we're lucky we are here. Because pretty soon these press conferences are just going to be periscopes, and, and it's just going to be a staff writer sitting in with the coach, or, or, or uh, yeah, or, uh, an SID, and um, it's really interesting. Cause, especially cause, in college, you could imagine college going there first. Well, especially a college like Ohio State or, or Michigan, where where the one coach has so much power, yeah. and, and they don't need the PR. I mean, let's be honest; they they don't need, and really the the. NBA teams don't need the PR either, no. and they could definitely self-manufacture that. So it's 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 crazy to see where it's going. It, it, it's definitely a scary time to be in the industry, but um, you know it's you know it, the industry has gone through shifts before, and, and it will go through shifts again. And it's just all about being uh, you know kind of ahead of those curves. Yeah, you got to be adaptable, and and no matter what, and this is something that I'm I'm doing with my own kids. Like mm-hmm. I don't care what they want to do. Yeah. With their lives. But like, so if when when my kid goes through a Legos phase, I'm like, yeah, there's probably not a future in Legos, but I'm going to teach him how to make a video about how he built the Legos. And oh, yeah. so if you always are working on building your own voice and learning how to communicate with people, it doesn't matter where the world goes. Right. It will always need people to communicate and formulate the, the, the narrative and the story and all that kind of stuff. So, oh, yeah. So I, I just we c- try and keep focusing on the best way to to yeah. story tell and build our own voice. Oh yeah, I mean I I think I'm stealing this from Dave McMenamin from that Richard Jefferson podcast, but it, it's like pos- positionless basketball now, where yeah. you can't just be a writer. You you have to you know it's I got into podcasting a, around a year ago, and, and I had always loved podcasts, and and I was glad I I finally did one, and I'm glad we're doing ours, but at least it's one of those things where where I can say okay, I've podcasted, I have podcasting experience, and you know you just get it started and, and you build the reps, and and it, it will take on whatever form it takes on, uh, and to kind of bring it full circle, I wrote a book, and and I didn't really have any desire to, to write a book, and, and it took a lot of uh, energy and, and a lot of work, and, and I think I've developed chronic back pain from sitting in a library <laughs> writing the book, but I it's something I can put on my resume. It's it's something I can say I did, and if I write a book again, I'll, I'll be better at it. So um, yeah, it's like leveling up. It's, yeah, it's it's not just. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's putting it on the resume, but now it's like, um, you know, if you've never if you've never changed an outlet in your house before, yeah, and you've never looked it up on YouTube, and then you watch that YouTube video, you learn a whole lot, and then when you actually do it in your house, yeah. you learn a whole lot more. Um, but until you've actually done it that first right. time, it's this big dark hole. Like I don't know, oh, I yeah. couldn't write a book. Yeah, you, of course you couldn't because you haven't done it. Right, like, you just have to start. Yeah, and and that was. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of when I was writing it, it's just like, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm putting these words down, and I'm going to send them to an editor. And how many either... how many times did you count the number of words you were up to? Oh, I well, I just I did it in a <laughs> word document, so I I had a running tally, and I kind of had yeah. basically the way I did it because I was working my job at Land of Ten at the time was. 
Um, and at Land of Ten, I pretty much was writing Monday through Sunday. And so I would pretty much write through the week, like right ahead, like spend my days and nights writing so that I could have free time on the weekends. And then I'd go to the library like Friday through Sunday to work on the book. Um, but that was, yeah, that, that I, I mean, I had very specific goals and, and I'm kind of, that's kind of how I just operate. But It's interesting you went to a, a different physical space to write the book. Yeah, well, that's, I... I because I worked at home when I worked at Land of Ten and at Bleacher Report, and I just, I couldn't even fathom, like, writing a book in that environment. I, like, had to be out and just be, and I would do that with work sometimes, too, but... So you listen to music? No, I, I would I couldn't listen to, I can't listen to anything when I write, okay. which is actually, now that I'm working in an, in an office, it's very uh, tough on my podcast listening habits, which has been, like, a big adjustment, because I'm, like, catching up a day late on Levitard on the way to work, and, yeah. and that's, like, what my podcasting world revolves around so that that's the biggest problem in my life right now is i need to catch up on podcasts See, I've, i i couldn't do music until i read a tip it was like find a, one song that you know super super well yeah and that won't annoy you and just put it on repeat yeah and so i have a few songs like if i really want to pump out some writing uh-huh i have a few songs that i will just play on repeat so that when they start over and you're at the beginning again it's just a, a momentary yeah. Like glance where you're thinking about the song, but I'm straight back into the writing. I think I could do music. I, and I think I have done music. But it, it, not new music. It would oh, have to no, be no, stuff no. you're so familiar with that it's just like reflexive yeah. listening. That's podcasting I couldn't do, though. No. Because that's, even when I'm just like pumping out like a mindless article here, it's like I have to be focused on one or the other. I, I just can't. And it's, I'm so. I'm so anal about my podcast listening. If I miss like the smallest detail in, in a Levitard show or in a Bill Simmons podcast, I'll hit that go back 15 I do the same seconds thing. as as many times as I need to because I'm like, I'll think about it all day. Oh, Ben, if, if you're, a psych- <laughs> you're a psycho like me. I um, had no idea. I yeah. had no idea. I always tell people because I, I was a talk radio guy um, and Sirius XM guy and Opie and Anthony guy. And mm-hmm. when Opie and Anthony came to Sirius XM and people who've listened to the podcast are tired of hearing me say this, but... I listened to every minute of every show that they were on Sirius yeah. XM from the beginning till Anthony got fired. Right. Every single minute of every show. Like, yeah. and, and if I missed 17 oh, seconds. That, that's how I am with Lebitard because they do a local hour in Miami yeah. that is only, it, it only airs, lo- like you can't stream it here. I mean, you can stream it through your phone, but for, on, on airwaves, it only airs in Miami on their 790 The Ticket. And I listen to the podcast of it every day. And they're talking about like Marlins baseball and like yep. the Miami Heat, which, which I find interesting. But, um, but it's just the kind of the, it, it's one of those shows that Opie and Anthony are the same way. They build a community and you want to be included in that community. Yeah. So I, I feel feel like I have to listen to the jokes in the local hours so I can truly appreciate it. All right. Well, it was a fun discussion. Let's uh, give the book plug one more time, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do our other podcast. Yeah, it is Urban Meyer versus College Football, the case for college football's greatest coach. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes & Noble. If you're in Cleveland, um, it's at most, in Bar- most Barnes & Nobles here. I, I know it's in Crocker Park uh, in Legacy Village. Um, but but online, I think, is typically the way people are getting it, and, and it's usually the best way to get it. Any uh, more signings? Um, I have a couple signings in Columbus next month. Okay. I don't have any in Northeast Ohio right now, but that could change. Um, and then check out our three sports podcasts, which we're about yep. to record, uh, which you can find on iTunes and, and Google Play. Yep, uh, and I set up a tiny URL for that. I'll put it in the link, the show notes, uh, but it's tinyurl.com forward slash the number three sports pod. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time. It's been the Waiting for Next Year.com podcast.